Well, turn with me now to Joel chapter 2. So Joel chapter 2, uh, near the end of the Old Testament, and we will read from verses 18 through the end of the chapter. So Joel 2, starting reading at verse 18. Uh, If you haven't been with us as we've been working our way through Joel, uh, up to this point in Joel, uh, it's been a fairly dark story of judgment uh, of the day of the Lord. And then picking up at verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I'm sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain, As before, the threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I'll show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, There shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Uh, Well, it will be helpful as we look at these these verses together. Uh, If you've got a Bible open in front of you, it means that you can follow along more easily. Uh, But even more importantly than that, it's great to have a Bible open uh, because this is the word of the living God. And because you're not to trust things just because I say it, Rather, you're to trust things because the Lord has spoken it in and through his word. Uh, so we come, before, um, come with me now and let's just pray to the Lord for his blessing on his word. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you, Lord, that all truth is your truth, that you are the God of truth. And Lord, we thank you for the Bible. Thank you for preserving it for thousands of years. Thank you for speaking in and through it powerfully, clearly, and authoritatively. And Lord, we pray that your word would have a governing influence on each one of our lives, that we would be not merely hearers of the word, but doers also. And that Lord, as we sit under your your word week by week, that your word would change us, uh, deepen our hope, strengthen our faith, cause our love to abound and make us to be more like Jesus. 
So please come now, Lord. Give us understanding. Give us the faith to believe that your word is indeed true and to put it into practice. And we pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you might have picked up that uh, many stories and books and films uh, have a key pivotal turning point. Uh, All hope seems to have been lost. The enemy seems to have won. It is the darkest day. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, hope leaps out and overcomes. A golem takes the ring from Frodo in the very center of Mount Doom, but then he falls into the fires beneath. Snow White is dead and encased, but then Prince Charming comes and gives a kiss and she's revived to life. A Cinderella is shamed and despairing as her Wicked stepmother and stepsisters go off to this ball, but then the fairy godmother arrives. Our Luke Skywalker is overcome and being killed by the emperor, but then Darth Vader switches sides out of love for his son. Now, the author of The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, he thought that this kind of idea of this narrative twist was so significant that he coined an entirely new word to express it. And the word is the word eucatastrophe. Eucatastrophe, great word. Uh, And it means, literally, a good catastrophe. This is what he wrote about it. He said, since we do not appear to possess a word, I will call it eucatastrophe, the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe, The sudden joyous turn, it's a sudden and miraculous grace, never to be counted on to recur, the sudden happy turn in a story which pierces you with a joy that brings tears. You catastrophe. And that word really expresses the function of the passage that we have just read together in the book of Joel. Up to now, the book of Joel has been a dark book. Chapter 1, devastating locust plague, harsh drought, famine and suffering. Joel 2, the day of the Lord, even worse than the locust plague, a foreign army devastating Jerusalem, tidal wave of judgment, repent and lament. But now all of that begins to change with a single verse. The ominous dark of night gives way to the bright light of day, you catastrophe. And so we're going to look at these verses in front of us under uh, two sections. And firstly, we're going to think about it under the idea of restoration. Now, you might remember that right at the start of the series on Joel, uh, I said that the book, of, that the structure of Joel is really the structure of the gospel, a judgment repentance, and then salvation. And now we're finally at salvation. And verse 18 is really the the verse or the hinge on which the entire book of Joel turns. Judgment looms. God's people have strayed. The day of the Lord approaches. Our hope is sparse. Then the Lord became jealous for his land, and had pity on his people. What changed? Now we can presume that maybe God's people did hear Joel's prophetic call. Maybe they did repent and lament and return to him. But that's not really actually the focus here. We're not actually told if they did or didn't repent. Instead, the wellspring of this mercy is God himself flowing from the very heart and jealousy of the one true God. You see, it's a reminder to us that actually salvation belongs to the Lord. And all true mercy uh, starts not with us and what we do, but actually starts with the Lord and what he does. You see, we serve the Lord who is jealous for his glory and who has tender compassion upon his people. And those two ideas are not are contradictory, but instead complementary. 
right? They're two strands of the same rope, two sides of the same coin. God's love for his glory and God's love for his people always go hand in hand in the scriptures. And so verses 19 through 27 really outline what this pity and jealousy look like for Israel. And really they're glorious hope-infused verses. They are as bright as the last passages have been dark. And the key word to notice in these verses before us is the word restore. If you look down at verse 25, now the Lord says there, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Or if you jump down to chapter 3 and verse 1, again you've got the use of that word restore. Now to restore something, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, is to return someone or something to an earlier good condition or position. Right, A neglected painting can be restored to its original condition. A person can be restored to health. A leader can be restored to a former position. A damaged car or house or bench top can be restored to what it was before. And that's really what we see playing out in these verses before us. In fact, you can trace lines between almost all of these verses and what's come before. To use just a few examples, uh, grain, wine, and oil stopped flowing in chapter 1. But now in verse 19, we're told they flow again. Uh, the northerner or the nor northern army was threatened in chapter 2. But now in verse 20, the northerner is expelled. Now in chapter 1, the beasts of the field pant and thirst in desperation. And now in verse 22, the pastures are green, the trees bear fruit. And it's not just a physical restoration, but actually a spiritual one as well. If you look down at verse 27, it says there, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. You see, the mercy that's being poured out here is as wide as the judgment that preceded it. But there is a difference, because restoration could imply simply a, a return to a previous condition. Right, a restored car is a car that has been returned to as good a condition as it was before. But that's not actually what's quite in play here. Instead, the, the idea is that Israel is in a better position than they've ever been before. Right, listen to some of this language. The fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Verse 23, he has poured down for you abundant rain. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow. You will eat in plenty. This isn't kind of a thrifty bare bones restoration. No, it's bigger. It's better than that. It's a language of abundance and prosperity. You see, it's a reminder to us that actually our God specializes in restoring the seemingly unrestorable. You can kind of imagine Israel looking over their land, a land that was first devastated by a locust plague, then presumably devastated by a foreign army. And it must have seemed to be utterly beyond restoration, hope snuffed out by the cold desolation before them. And maybe you have areas actually in your life that feel unrestorable, maybe suffering that you have passed through or continue to pass through, maybe mental illness that dogs you, maybe addictive sins that hold you in chains, Maybe sharp grief or raw guilt and shame. And it can feel at times that those areas of our lives are unrestorable. But our God specializes in restoring that which seems beyond restoration. Uh, he will restore to you the years. There's a beautiful old hymn that really reflects on this beautiful truth. And it's a hymn that some of you uh, older ones here, um, I'm looking at you, Albert and John, may know, and it's called, Come Ye Disconsolate. And these are the words, they're really beautiful words. They say, Come ye disconsolate, wherever you languish. 
Come to the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Here bring your wounded hearts, here tell your anguish. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Joy of the desolate, light of the straying, hope of the penitent, fadeless and pure. Here speaks the comforter, tenderly saying, Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot cure. Here see the bread of life, see waters flowing, forth from the throne of God, pure from above. Come to the feast of love, come ever knowing. Earth has no sorrows, but heaven can remove. And those beautiful words. You see, fear not and have no doubt that the Lord is able to restore to you the years, able to restore to you that which seems beyond restoration. He is willing and he is able, and earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And so surely we, as God's people today, have every reason, just like Israel in this passage, to fear not, to be glad and rejoice and to praise the name of the Lord our God. And actually, in in many ways, these verses before us are just so gospel-y, right? You've got an instant dramatic change from severe judgment to glorious restoration, right? The tone just shifts in the book of Joel so suddenly from grave to glad, from judgment to jubilee, from lamentation to celebration. And actually, that's the rhythm of the gospel, isn't it? That's what happens when you come to know Jesus. That in a dramatic moment, you're taken from judgment to blessing. Taken from death to life. Taken from the very brink of hell to the very gates of heaven. You catastrophe. So firstly, we have restoration in the first half of the passage. And then in the second half of the passage, we have what could be termed salvation. So there's kind of this glorious restoration at play for Israel here. And verses 28 downward continue that theme, right? They're meant to be read together. Just as the Lord poured down rain for Israel, so now he will pour down his Holy Spirit upon them. And so in these later verses, Joel takes this idea of restoration and he really blows it out to a cosmic scale. That this restoration, this outpouring of sovereign grace will go beyond the borders of Israel and impact the New Testament church and actually all of creation. Now as verse 28 implies, if you look down at it, uh, this happens afterward, at a later stage from the restoration that Israel experienced. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, verses 28 through 32 actually form a completely separate chapter from chapter 2. Now, as we read read these verses before us, this is language we know, right? As Dion read for us, this is language that Peter picks up uh, as he preaches at Pentecost. And if you look down, verses 28 and 29 really highlight two aspects of the Spirit's coming. Uh, Firstly, he highlights the abundance Right, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out. This is no trickle, but instead this is a flood. And secondly, he uh, puts a focus on the universality, that this will be to all of God's people. Right, If you look at that language, all flesh, your sons and your daughters, old men and young men, even male and female servants. Now, many of you probably know that while the Holy Spirit was deeply and fundamentally fundamentally active in the Old Testament, yet most of the times that he's mentioned, it's in relation to a someone, right? A prophet, a priest, a king, someone set aside for a specific calling. But actually following Pentecost, the Spirit would be poured out on all of God's people without exception. And the implication being that actually if you're a Christian here this evening, then the Holy Spirit has been poured out on you. That you have dwelling within you the same Spirit that rushed upon Samson so that he could rip the lion into pieces. 
You have the same spirit that was poured out on David so that he could write those beautiful psalms which resonate with our hearts. You have the same spirit that was poured out on Ezekiel so he could prophesy to the bones in the valley, commanding them to come to life. I mean, isn't that remarkable? That that same spirit of the living God dwells in you if you're a believer, empowers you to participate in his mission, and fills you with his presence. Now, if you look down at verse 30, it switches gear again. And now it seems to be talking about Jesus' second coming. That just as the Lord led his people in the Exodus by a pillar of smoke, so God would come down to earth again. Just as he turned the Nile River to blood and poured out fire from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah, so it would be a day of judgment. Now one question that is worth asking at this point is what's the connection between Pentecost and Jesus' second coming, right? We probably don't usually associate those with each other. But here they're placed side by side as if they belong together. So what's the connection? Well, the answer can be found in John the Baptist's words in Matthew 3. Uh, John is baptizing with water, and this is what he says. He says, he who is coming after me is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So there again, we've got Holy Spirit and fire placed side by side. You see, there were two clear expectations of what would happen when the Messiah arrived. The Spirit would be poured out and there would be judgment on the wicked. And so really the connection is that the pouring out of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost is the confirmation that the last days have come. Now, the confirmation that we live in the age of the Messiah, it is the beginning of the end. It starts at Pentecost, and it returns when Jesus comes back. You might think of it as being a little bit like uh, the whistle that indicates the final quarter in a basketball game. That if you hear that whistle at that specific point in the basketball game, now the game isn't over yet, but you know it's the beginning of the end. You know that the time left remaining is numbered. And really that's the idea here that Pentecost was that whistle. Pentecost was the whistle indicating the beginning of the end, indicating that we now live in the last days We've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and next comes the baptism of fire in the final judgment. That if the Holy Spirit has been poured out, then it's only a matter of time until the fire comes down also. And so fittingly, Joel tells us in these verses how we can be sure we are ready for that day of fire and blood. And he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you might know if you know your Bibles well that uh, Paul picks up that language in Romans chapter 10. And he explains that what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, it means to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. But notice the very final verse of the chapter. All who call on the Lord will be saved but the survivors will be those on whom the Lord calls. So let me read that out again. Uh, it will come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. And really the logic of that, just to make very explicit, is that we only ever call on God because God first calls on us, right? That's what it's simply saying. We love because God first loved us. We call upon God in faith because God first calls upon us. You see, brothers and sisters, salvation belongs to the Lord and him alone. And actually, there are so many man-centered gospels floating around in the world at the moment. But salvation belongs to the Lord. 
and to him alone. So the Spirit has come, and next will come the fire. But all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You catastrophe. The sudden, unexpected turn at the darkest moment. So sudden, so glorious that you catch your breath. Your heart beats wildly. And tears of joy come to your eyes. Uh, Later in that piece of writing from Tolkien that we read earlier, uh, Tolkien claims that the greatest eucatastrophe of all time was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, The moment where death was unexpectedly, dramatically replaced by a life that would never end. And actually we get to experience eucatastrophe as we call upon the name of the Lord, and we share in his resurrection life, as we are restored, changed in a moment, and taken from the brink of hell to the gates of heaven. And actually, this passage is a reminder to us that we will experience a still greater eucatastrophe when our Lord returns. It will be a day of fire and blood, a day of terrible judgment, And yet for all who have believed, it will be the dawning of indestructible joy. The final restoration of ourselves, of our lost years, and ultimately of all creation itself. And we look forward with eager, trusting faith to that day. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you, Lord, that you are a God who has pity and compassion upon your people. That, Lord, we know that the story of Israel and Joel is our story also. Our Lord, a story of deserving judgment, a story of straying from you, and yet a story of unexpected, dramatic, and powerful restoration. And so, Lord, we thank you for the grace we have received in Jesus Christ. We pray that we would never grow blasé, our Lord, about the sheer incredible privilege of what it means to be your people and the redeemed of the Lord. And Lord, we thank you that the work you have begun in us, you will surely bring to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you for the restoration we have experienced, and thank you for the final restoration that will come when you come, Lord Jesus, in power with your holy angels and at the sound of a trumpet. And Lord, we look forward with faith to that day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.